we see you. Give us one second. There you are. Here we go. Thank you. Wonderful. I'm glad glad all the technology worked out. Um, well, I want to uh, start by uh, thanking uh, Vitali and and just mentioning how much of a privilege it is and has been to work with him for better and or better and worse. He's closer to the events that we're we're describing. So thank you to Vitali. Thank you to uh, David and Ponars for giving us this opportunity to present our work. Um, let me share my screen uh, so you can actually see something uh, interesting rather than just me. Um, here it is, and I have to, can you guys see my presentation? I think it's coming up, right? Uh, wonderful. So we are, we're doing research on the effects of the war on Ukrainian uh, farms. And uh, we basically have two ongoing uh, questions uh, and, and research aims. And one is just to document uh, the damage to Ukrainian farms, and then also to, to sort of analyze the damage and draw conclusions about really what Russia's uh, intentions are. Um, so, so far we've, we've, this is an ongoing research effort. We've examined um, patterns of, of harm and destruction. Um, and um, we basically uh, make two claims. One is that uh, the damage is quite uh, severe and varied. We document four types of critical damage uh, that have far reaching consequences for Ukraine and the world. And based on this uh, uh, finding, we conclude that the Russian military is actually quite deliberately targeting farm related assets and infrastructure. So the damage to farming is not just collateral damage. It's not, not a coincidence. It's actually um, uh, deliberate and targeted. Um, <clears throat> so just for most of you will, will already know this, but, but just a couple of words. Uh, by way of introduction. Ukraine is one of Eurasia's most fertile and important agricultural producer and export. And mostly that's due to a very fortunate confluence of uh, soil uh, quality, rainfall patterns, and, and long growing season, because we're, Ukraine is quite southern. Um, so agriculture is really, really important for the Ukrainian economy and um, accounting for about 10% of GDP. And it's also really, really important for Ukrainian exports. It um, accounts for 41% of Ukrainian exports in 21. Uh, Russia, uh, sorry, Ukraine, Ukraine uh, used to mostly supply uh, its neighbors, but it has really globalized agriculture over the last sort of 15 years. Um, and China is the single largest exporter of Ukrainian uh, agri-food projects, um, with the EU, EU being second, for uh, especially, uh, sorry, uh, with India being second and the EU uh, being third. So uh, since the war began in February, um, Ukrainian farms have really been at the target of, of harm and destruction. And we document four types of damage. One is theft, second is disruption of the growing season, third is the damage to infrastructure, and fourth is the naval blockade. So one of the things we're, we're hoping to do going forward is, is to do more research on these different uh, types of damage. Uh, and, and an important thing to note is that they have different uh, long-term costs associated with them. So theft, um, you, you may have uh, heard about looting and, and I think we often think of uh, things that uh, uh, Russian soldiers could just sort of carry away uh, like electronics and, and other valuables. Uh, this has actually also aff uh, affected really valuable uh, farm assets such as machinery tractors, combines and other high-tech equipment that are used in 21st century farming. Um, since grain has matured in this growing season, it's also actually affected grain. Um, so Russian, uh, Russian tankers have left the occupied territories with, with grain on, on, um, uh, on their ships. Um, a second really important factor has been the disruption of the growing season. So there's many aspects of this and I don't really want to spend too much time summarizing them, um, but they, they, they vary quite a, a bit. So one of the things that happened initially is that actually spring is a time of harvest in Ukraine for, the, for winter wheat. So spring uh, harvest was disrupted. Uh, it, there's actually also damage to um, fields uh, with, with mines and, and from the direct occupation. A second really important thing has been uh, the scarcity of inputs. So uh, all kinds of inputs for Ukrainian agriculture have uh, traditionally been imported from Russia or Belarus. So that is uh, 
uh, fertilizer, um, seeds and, and, and herbicides and so on. So all of these inputs have been disrupted and are now really, really expensive for Ukrainian farms. Uh, labor shortage obviously speaks for, for itself. Um, Ukrainian men um, have to fight and then Ukrainian women are left on the farms or uh, often have to had to leave. Um, the last uh, factor of this is the uh, fires that have been set to uh, fields that are ready to har harvest. So that has been incredibly destructive as well. Um, the, the third type of damage uh, may be the one with the most important uh, long-term uh, consequences because uh, uh, important farm infrastructure uh, was targeted. Uh, so this concerns all kinds of uh, infrastructure. So it's on the one hand, uh, machinery we, on the little picture uh, shows a destroyed tractor. Uh, it's also uh, other expensive infrastructure, such as irrigation system, uh, perennial crops, uh, storage and transport infrastructure, port infrastructure. Um, and the one that I find particularly um, sad is, is the uh, missile, the shelling of Ukraine's national gene bank, which obviously has a lot of long-term consequences. Uh, the fourth type uh, is the damage uh, that stems from the naval blockade. So uh, we, we uh, know that the majority of Ukrainian gra grains has been exported via uh, the sea um, and via the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov. Azov. So as, as you know, um, four ports uh, remain inaccessible due to the occupation and six further ports are unable to accept or uh, send cargo. So this situation changed in uh, July um, when the grain corridor was negotiated and has allowed for limited exports of grain. grain. Um, this, however, is quite limited. It's, it's, it's a very, it's a very um, difficult situation uh, and still a lot of grain remains in, in Ukraine and it's sort of piling up as the harvest is happening um, right now. Um, so what do we what do we conclude? We we uh, we know everyone knows that um, Ukrainian land uh, and and grain has historically played a central role uh, in Russian political history, and it's hard to avoid the conclusion that uh, Ukraine's Chernozem uh, with the richness of Ukrainian agriculture uh, are not actually. Uh, critical war aims. Russia is, is trying to also Ukraine uh, control Ukrainian farm together with Ukrainian uh, populations and territory, because that in many ways gives Russia uh, advantages and global trade, uh, trade markets, and it gives Russia uh, leverage over poor countries that depend on Eurasian grain. Um, so here are our emails. Uh, uh, the, the, the photos are from a, a recent article in the Times Magazine. And um, I don't actually know as, if Vitaly is here. He wanted to uh, also address the audiences with a couple of words. Vitaly, are you here? <clears throat> he, he was here earlier today and he hasn't uh, been able to uh, stay online consistently because of what's going on uh, in Stomir. So, so he may not be here. So I will actually conclude um, and he, he may turn up later in the, in the, in the panel and, and wait, but thanks for the time and, and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Dan. Next up, we have Adam Stover from the Georgia Institute of Technology, deciphering Russia's playbook, lessons from the lead up to Putin's war in Ukraine. Thank you, David. Thank you, Polinars. Um, and I first want to acknowledge my uh, doctoral student, Dennis Murphy, who was uh, very ably in helping me in this broader project. But let me just start by saying that my memo was really motivated by a statement that uh, Jake Sullivan made that, uh, during 2021, and he, I think he repeated it several times, which is uh, when asked about what was going on with Russia, he said, well, we uh, don't know their intentions, but we certainly know their playbook. Um, and it, that struck me as kind of interesting, because if you look at uh, the course of 2021, and unfortunately, we have sort of an endpoint to look at things since uh, February of 2022 marked a transition 
in the nature of the, in the strategic interaction. But throughout 2021, there was really sort of a muddle about what was going on in terms of coercion. Uh, obviously, if we knew what their strategy was, it didn't seem that our strategy was uh, up to the task because we are uh, using uh, sanctions as a form of deterrence uh, seemed to fail uh, miserably. We had also, if you remember, put uh, real limitations on uh, the nature of our statecraft because obviously we took uh, direct engagement off the table. Uh, there was obviously throughout the, the year the changing amplitude of Russia's own uh, coercive maneuvers, especially using military uh, statecraft. Um, and arguably Russia's uh, statecraft, as we've heard uh, today and, and, by, and noted by others, had gone through some sort of change during that period, uh, shifting from a deterrence role to more uh, coercive or uh, compellence uh, to ultimately the, the use of force in uh, February. Uh, and also, when we look back at the record, uh, there's a, seemingly a lot of disconnect between what Russia was saying and what Russia was doing in terms of the targets. Uh, there was uncertainty of, of who uh, the actual audience was uh, for uh, many of the threatening statements. Uh, the timing of those statements did not seem to sort of match uh, the actual timing of, of a range of events on the ground. And it wasn't also clear what domain uh, a lot of these threats were actually taking place. Uh, was it the military, the military exercises, was it on the economic plane, was it on the energy plane? So there's a lot of things going on. Uh, so it was very difficult to parse uh, what the actual strategy uh, was. And of course, in the background of all this, among experts in the room here and those who follow uh, Russian foreign security strategy, there's been a rife debate over the actual ways. While there's been a lot of attention uh, to the ends and means, the ways have been sort of left out. Now, there have been a number of people that have begun to uh, define what strategic deterrence uh, means or next generation warfare or even reflexive control, but these logics are very different and potentially very different from our ways of thinking about uh, coercion. And then finally, when we look back at 2021, we see uh, a very confused and reactionary uh, US and NATO uh, set of statecraft. And some argued that NATO was even self-deterred in a number of these occasions. So suffice to say, there's a lot of noise and a lot of confusion about uh, coercive diplomacy, uh, especially leading up to uh, the, the uh, war in 2021. So this memo is part of a broader undertaking to try to parse some of these issues. And uh, let me just note that this memo is very much in a preliminary state and it's uh, and we're trying to develop this uh, in many more different in many more dimensions. But in essence, what we're trying to do over the broader project is to to first look at what the patterns of behavior. And we tend to think about uh, Russia's coercive behavior in single uh, domains. Uh, the military compels us. A very interesting report that's recently out by uh, Rand that that talks about uh, Russia's military statecraft. Uh, but that's just one domain. Of it. And as I mentioned, when we look back at the record, there is a lot of a lot of things going on across multiple domains uh, that distinguish sort of military operational statecraft from uh, broader forms of strategic uh, signaling. Uh, also, uh, what what is the logic uh, behind this? Some of our broader research suggests that, whereas at base, the, uh, much of the Western canon is rooted in when we're talking about coercion and breaking it down into deterrence and compellence, it's rooted in uh, issues related to credibility, bolstered by capability and commitment. But a lot of it turns on demonstrating uh, cap uh, credibility. And this is something that was aired in the previous conversation. Uh, but when we look more specifically at the Russian uh, discourse, it's not clear that credibility is really the defining concept uh, of these various logics. Uncertainty, uh, manipulation, uh, uh, affecting the decision-making, uh, indirectly, in a nonlinear way, uh, are, are things that are associated with the Russian concept. So this is what we're trying to disaggregate. And so in this memo, what we tried to do is look more specifically during 2021 to see if we could find any distinguishing traits uh, associated with Russia's coercive behavior and potentially signals to pay attention to uh, that may be more uh, complicated to discern because they may be across different domains and directed towards different audiences uh, simultaneously. Uh, so what we tried to do 
is marshal some of our not only our qualitative uh, insight into how the Russian the, what the Russian discourse is among the strategic uh, scholars as well as uh, some of the officials, but to begin to use larger data sets uh, to map uh, Russia's posture across multiple domains simultaneously, and to begin to annotate uh, these uh, larger data sets with with known events. Uh, and then ultimately, what we're trying to do is zoom in to the specific discourse uh, to see if there are actually signals that take place uh, across domains and across uh, different audiences. And so the uh, bottom line for our uh, memo uh, is that uh, we do see, uh, do discern uh, some general patterns in Russia's course of uh, behavior versus ours. They tend to focus on military and legal uh, dimensions of uh, and diplomatic dimensions of statecraft, whereas we have focused primarily in 2021 on economic uh, dimensions. Uh, also, uh, we they have more of a divergent approach uh, to warfare, not only focusing on blurring the notion between peace and war in our concept, uh, but also adding this dimension of reflexive control that I mentioned, which is really aimed at distorting uh, the environment. Uh, surrounding the decision making rather than creating explicit uh, graduated threats uh, aimed at creating uh, credible uh, dimensions to uh, statecraft. And one of the things that we found kind of, that was kind of interesting is some of the, the, um, the ways of starting to think about uh, looking for signals that are beyond unidimensional uh, ways. So this was sort of just using a, a, a event set, a set of data sets, and I don't want to get into all the details, but Really, these are uh, this is sort of a uh, U.S. coercion uh, attempts directed towards Russia, and this is uh, Russia's towards the United States, and this is uh, sort of how this is communicated uh, to the in the Western press and into the to the Russian press. And so, if I just direct your attention here, one of the things that's interesting is this disconnect between uh, the domains of coercive threats that uh, Russia uh, conveys or is, is conveyed both in the Western context and in the Russian context, and uh, as they begin to converge, and we know now as an endpoint in the beginning part of uh, 2022, uh, that suggested a shift in strategy from possibly deterrence, compellence to actually the use of force. Not This is not validated. I would not suggest that this is the, the be all and end all, but this is suggestive of the types of things, types of research we're gonna need to do to look at cross-domain types of coercion. Um, and then we sort of were trying to understand what is reflexive control uh, and how do we measure that? Again, using some of these tools, we can begin to code different types of behavior, not just coercive behavior, but other kinds of uh, cooperative e efforts, manipulative efforts, uh, using some of these data sets, plotting sort of known red line statements and seeing if there's any kind of convergence. Uh, here pretty, pretty uh, continuous uh, and consistent between the domestic and international signaling towards Ukraine, uh, but again, uh, a disconnect and, and more of a convergence, and that convergence actually grows uh, once you go into uh, 2022. So let me stop here by suggesting some of the preliminary findings from our research is that we see when we're talking about strategic coercion, uh, there's much more of a cross-domain a dimension to it that makes it very challenging for our, our, our traditional ways of approaching strategic interaction. We see that there's much more non-reciprocal, non-linear elements. There's an issue of uh, looking at the convergence in the multiple audiences uh, that they're signaling towards. There is a potentially di very different set of logics operating here that we need to pay attention to. So the earlier conversation about the nuclear threat, it's not clear that uh, the nuclear dimension is the only part of the signaling that's going on. Uh, and of course, this has dramatic implications in some of our research is really trying to parse what red lines mean explicitly or implicitly. Where is that difference between uh, competition in that horizontal space that may be punctuated and lead to an escalatory issue that may speak to what uh, some people are calling the stability instability paradox within the gray zone? And we question whether or not that exists. And so all of this of course, is somewhat moot right now because we're not in just a strictly coercive stage. We're actually in war. Uh, but at some point, we're going to reach an equilibrium there, and we're going to be faced with this long-term uh, competition. And how to read signals, how to compete, how to influence are going to be front and center. And it's not clear that Mr. Sullivan is right that we do actually know their ways. So let me stop. There.
Thank you very much, Adam. Next up, we have Maria Malicheva from the National War College. United We Stand, how Russia's soft and smart power shaped countries' positions on Moscow's war. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so my presentation and my memo um, complement Adam's uh, research really well because I too am looking into uh, the various foreign policy tools in Russia's um, tool playbook, but uh, extending um, those uh, foreign policy tools uh, beyond the coercive diplomacy to include uh, arms sale and info propaganda and so on and so forth. Um, so. So, but the gist of my presentation is in its title. So uh, there is a worldwide condemnation of Russia's aggression towards Ukraine. And the Biden administration here in Washington has put in a concerted effort to rally United support, especially among the um, like-minded, um, highly developed um, democratic nations. Interestingly, though, that uh, behind those loud voices condemning um, Russia's aggression in Ukraine uh, delivered in various international forums, um, G7, NATO, the European Union, there has been what I call matter uh, by a sizable group of countries um, which have yet to condemn Russia's actions in the harshest terms or uh, to um, show strongest possible support to Ukraine or simply unwilling to take sides um, in this conflict. And I, I think the cracks in the United Front receive very little attention. And when they do receive attention, uh, they're usually attributed to the so-called Southern dimension because of the country's you know, shared colonial past. Or in the instance of India or a handful of African nations, it's because of uh, the uh, non-alignment non posture. And what I uh, do in this memo and in my research um, that went into this memo, I tried to show that there is actually another common denominator, which is Russia's foreign policy that helped us understand where countries, where countries stand um, in um, Russia's um, war in Ukraine. So I uh, drew on a lot of data that I've already had um, that pertain on uh, various types of, you know, informational, political, diplomatic, um, military influence that Russia has tried to exert overseas. And I use countries roll call votes in the United Nations General Assembly as kind of a proxy of where they stand um, in this conflict. And as you remember, back in March and April, the United Nations held um, a number of emergency sessions. And in March, one of those emergency sessions adopted the resolution condemning Russia's um, war in Ukraine. And uh, it's the resolution uh, A-ES 11 slash LE. Um, and in that resolution, the majority of countries obviously voted, uh, supported this resolution, but 40 uh, did not. So five voted against and 35 abstained. Um, and in April, another resolution uh, suspended Russia's membership in the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council. And in that case, um, 55 or 58 states abstained and 24 voted against that resolution. And this also doesn't include a handful of countries that completely ignored um, the votes and did not show up. Okay, so I'm using this as a proxy and then I kind of run statistical analysis with a number of independent variables measuring Russia's foreign policy tools. And the remainder of my presentation will focus on three trends um, that I identified in those analysis. And you can see all the results in my memo when it comes out. So trend number one, I was not surprised to find that countries which were the recipients of Russia's arms um, in uh, years preceding uh, its invasion of Ukraine were also more likely to vote against, especially the second uh, resolution and uh, or abstain uh, voting for that resolution. 
So Russia's share of um, global arms sales is you know, cut off a little bit. Russia is here. Okay, um, so Russia has been, despite all the, despite the sanctions that have been levied on Russia after uh, it, it annexed Crimea, it has uh, retained um, second position after the United States uh, as a global arms um, supplier. And even it um, did lose, uh, I think like 22% in terms of the, kind of the total revenue uh, raised from arms sales. It, sought to extend its markets in Southeast Asia in particular, and it was able to sign a number of lucrative military agreements in, with uh, a number of countries in Africa. So just to give you a few examples, um, in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Myanmar, Malaysia, Indonesia, all of which abstained or voted against the United Nations General Assembly resolution, suspending Russia's membership in the United Nations Human Rights Council, they've been among the largest importers of Russia's arms. In Africa, uh, Moscow brokered military sales deals with 20 countries since 2017. And just to give a couple of examples, Nigeria and Ethiopia, both uh, signing uh, arms deals in recent years, also among those who either skipped the vote or voted against um, the second document. So that's first trend. The second trend is this. So you wouldn't think about Russia as a, a donor. Right, uh, because uh, whatever developmental and humanitarian assistance it has supplied to countries in need, it pales in comparison to the levels of um, developmental and humanitarian aid um, uh, provided by the United States, other traditional donors, and even China. But interestingly, uh, I found uh, some correlation between where Russia sent its developmental assistance in 2019, but more importantly, so this is the chart. Uh, this is the uh, map uh, that I was able to put together on the basis of data we collected for another project on where Russia sent its uh, COVID-19 assistance. So Russia sent its COVID-19 aid mostly in kind to uh, about 40 countries around the world in all regions of the world. And I think it really took an opportunity to uh, uh, exploit that moment uh, when the United States response was very slow, inconsistent, and very heavily politicized to uh, kind of instrumentalize the use of scarce uh, medical supplies and other medical resources. And uh, some of those deliveries were accompanied by, um, because there's lots of pomp, uh, you, you know, usually there will be a phone call placed by either the foreign minister or the president itself. And then it will be like very swift um, um, gathering of the supplies that will be shipped or aired on the military air jets. Um, and so the bottom line is that you know, this effort seemed to pan out, at least in the short run, because in my analysis, countries which were selected by Russia as the recipients of its COVID-19 assistance, as well as those that received developmental assistance in year or two prior to its invasion of Ukraine, were also more likely to abstain or vote it against the United Nations resolution. And trend number three, um, not surprising here. So Russia has a very extensive ecosystem um, that is involved in spreading disinformation or uh, uh, propaganda in support of Russia's positions, um, really trying to change hearts and minds and to develop more favorable perceptions of Russia around the world. And um, so this ecosystem consists of trolls and bots and uh, uh, Russian government that, that, uh, uh, linked um, sites, some of which are run by, run by intelligence services. But it's also, uh, it also in includes the uh, uh, kind of more conventional international media uh, linked to the Russian government, like RT and Sputnik in particular. So I use the presence of RT for satellites um, uh, in, Broadcasting RT as a as a proxy to see, I mean it's not a perfect measure, um, uh, but we do know that in those contexts, um, RT um, uh, news usually get retweeted um, on, um, on on Twitter. And as a matter of fact, the research that I looked at shows that in uh, in Spanish speaking context, in particular, RT uh, is the most retweeted uh, platform. Um, and um, and so what I find is that. Uh, countries uh, which had uh, RT viewership uh, before the conflict. And before the conflict, um, uh, RT operated pay television and free to air channels in more than 100 countries, and they provided content in multiple languages. Uh, but it's also important to know that, um, so I plugged in a, a variable that measures 
countries' values based on world value survey data. I was particularly interested in uh, you know the scores on traditional values, uh, which measure you know how much families support, how much their countries support family uh, values or deference to authority, and then that uh, the security survival values. So uh, countries that score high on those values, they also prioritize border insecurity. It was in those countries um, that scored high on those values of, of survival and traditional values that Russia's RT variable was particularly significant. So Russia was exploiting um, um, those pre-existing sentiments or um, values to um, disseminate its uh, uh, propaganda and, um, and uh, disinformation. But there also, I think um, I'm running out of time, but there are also some lessons that we can probably learn from all of that. Um, or rather maybe a question uh, that, that also needs to be asked and, and answered. So one, I mean, um, despite you know, the sanctions um, and despite the toll of war, um, Russia continues using particularly its informational and political levers in many countries. And we kind of, we, 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 we overlook that dimension. Um, but then there's also a question, what do we do with those countries um, that haven't yet taken size or uh, continue benefiting from some kind of relationship with Russia? Do we punish them? Um, do the punishment, is the punishment going to change their, those governments' behavior? Um, you know, what, what, are, what are the counter effects of the punishment and secondary sanctions that we might encounter, especially in medium and long term? Um, we should also recognize that besides Europe and the United States where RT was banned uh, and been much more successful at countering propaganda of the Russian Federation, um, those efforts have not been nearly as successful in many other contexts, again, particularly in Finnish speaking countries, not, not every country, but nevertheless. And so, um, and I think it also kind of calls for a little bit of soul searching in terms of, you know, are there some legitimate claims and concerns that we overlook and, you know, that we, we should consider, but more importantly, I mean, we if we are indeed very much concerned about global unity, uh, we need to be more circumspect and think in terms of you know long-term, more comprehensive and diversified approaches to countries that are caught in the middle of um, this horrible war. Thank you. Thank you. And we have Maria Snegerla from Georgetown University. Fighting yesterday's war, Soviet influences in Putin's foreign policy. Um, thank you very much. Really honored to be here in this uh, really great um, group of participants. Uh, so uh, we talk a lot about um, Russia's behavior in Ukraine, and this is an attempt to explain the key um, elements, or maybe some of the uh, internal thinking within the Russian elites that could explain uh, to us uh, what is actually going on. Now, scholars often uh, bring up Russia's revanchism, or commentators, right, often mention Russia's revanch revanchism uh, when they describe uh, Russia's uh, behavior towards Ukraine in particular. However, in uh, IR scholarship, a more uh, prominent term is revisionism. Uh, which refers to uh, cases when uh, states try to improve their own position vis-a-vis the, uh, the world order. The problems with this term, um, this is uh, as we discover in this project, um, is that this term is quite ill-defined and really it applies to pretty much everything. Revisionism in IR, everybody is revisionist. So we are not happy uh, with this term. And instead, in this particular paper, uh, together with uh, Alexander Lanoshka from Berlin Royal University, we will form um, to reconsider to revanchism. Uh, let's revise revanchism. Uh, the problem with revanchism is that this term is actually not uh, very well defined in the literature at all. Uh, you'd be surprised how few uh, studies actually mention it, and even fewer um, attempts uh, to define it. Uh, they are uh, the original. Uh, the term originates from the French word for revenge, revenge uh, 
um, when uh, France has experienced a national humiliation after losing Alsace and Lorraine um, to the German Empire, to the Second German Empire. Now, how we propose in this paper to look at Jimarchism is uh, uh, two key elements. So we include in this term two key elements. First of all, Jimarchism has to do with the lost uh, territory. And in that sense, it's first of all different from Irredentism, which um, has to do with the presence of the trying to incorporate former ethnic minorities and whatnot. Uh, second of all, it limits the pools of states to those who have a uh, history of imperial authority. Uh, that's one of the reasons actually that we don't really see as many instances of uh, revanchism in recent, in recent uh, contemporary history, just as many former empires left uh, in the world, uh, the, with few exceptions such as the Russia, which was maybe in the 1990s. So our definition of revanchism is that it applies primarily to those states whose main predecessors have governed directly and formal territories no longer under their sovereign control. And as you can see, Russia's actions towards Ukraine, uh, in respect to, for example, the collapse of the Soviet Union, is a direct application of this term. Now, what explains uh, revanchism? Yeah, sorry. There are a number of article, uh, arguments made in the literature. Most of them have to do with revisionism, but a few modifications you can apply the same arguments towards revanchism. Uh, many of them have their own issues. Of the time rotation, I'm not going to go into that, but many over predict, uh, first of all, the instances of revanchism. And uh, also, uh, when it comes to individual leaders' beliefs, that's not a popular idea, so it's all about personality. Um, that um, is an explanation that unfortunately ignores broader contextual factors that make the very emergence of a particular leader in power possible. So we identify that as a pronounced gap in the literature, and we argue that what often is missing is the role of the elites where a particular type of leadership emerges. Uh, so why uh, is focus on elites important? Uh, so certain substantive beliefs endure and retain salience over their alternatives, especially when you have particular elite composition. Uh, it also, the elite composition also constrains what sort of leaders can come to power in any given political context. And of course, it ensures the continuity of in elite practice. And what I'm going to show in my next slide is that uh, the Russian case actually is a very good fit uh, for that. I think I'm preaching to the choir uh, here. Um, so in Russia and um, my previous research has shown that there was hardly any serious elite rotation on top as a result of the collapse of the Soviet system. Uh, you can take other uh, Eastern European countries as an example. You can notice that in countries like the Baltics, for example, or Hungary or Poland, there are only 30 to 40 percent of the of the elites from the previous regime survived. Not the case of Russia. In Russia, by multiple accounts, up to 80% of former um, Soviet elites, the, those who belong to the so-called nomenclatura, uh, social groups, they survived in power. And as Mark Kramer here has demonstrated, uh, in particular, that was pronounced among those elites who are, are responsible for foreign policy uh, decision-making. Uh, my own uh, recent work published this year in post-Soviet affairs shows that unfortunately this continuity continues to be pronounced even in Putin's today's elites. We estimated Putin's top 100 political elites uh, for different ways to discover that up to 60% of Putin's uh, top 100 elites uh, have their roots in uh, nomenclatura, and that share definitely surpasses, significant surpasses the share of Simoniki. The security service uh, representatives where the scholarship was focused on. <clears throat> uh, in this paper <clears throat> with Alexander, we also estimate the uh, share of um, uh, elites with nomenclature backgrounds, estimated by their late Soviet career track, in security council. Uh, Russian security councils is one of the main uh, foreign policy decision making bodies in Russian politics. We, this is in progress, so we haven't made it all the way until early Yeltsin. Apologies about that. But you'll notice, nonetheless, a clear pipe, right? There's actually a highly <clears throat> pronounced share, that's of majority, 60 to 70% of all of the um, members of security councils, 
do have uh, their have their backgrounds in the capital. So what does it mean uh, in terms of the foreign policies? What does it tell us about uh, their foreign policy preferences? Now, a lot has been said about how Putin writes his and how he's bringing up the Soviet Union. But even if you look at Yeltsin's Russia in the 1990s, you see plenty of common overtones, themes already pronounced um, among those groups in the early 1990s. Among them, uh, this sense of national humiliation and deep insecurity about Russia's international status, an attempt to preserve as much as possible of the Cold War status quo. In our paper, we complement that with multiple citations from the political leadership at the time, where pretty much all groups on both sides of the political spectrum emphasize the same ideas, including the opposition to NATO, perception of the West as ultimately hostile to the Russian interest. And of course, as one way to hold on to this great power status, claims to reassert Russia's control and ownership of parts of the Soviet Union. With that in mind, the obsession with Ukraine uh, became pronounced really early on. Uh, Suffice is to say uh, that already in 1992 and uh, 1993, Russia's Soviet um, uh, um, even passed two resolutions uh, claiming uh, that transfer of Crimea under Khrushchev was illegal. There were multiple attempts uh, to um, emphasize control over Ukraine. Yeltsin even refused uh, for a while to recognize Ukraine's borders already back in the 1990s, right? All of that lasted all the way up until late 1990s when Putin essentially picked up on the same ideas. Our argument here is that you should not over obsess with Putin. It's not only about Putin, right? Putin is just a product and maybe some sort of common combination of these ideas of revanchism, which was present already among the Russian elites since uh, 1990s, pretty much since the collapse of the Soviet Union, because of their composition. Those were pretty much the same people socialized under the Soviet times who held on to their uh, Cold War shaped uh, preferences. Uh, last but not the least, if you look at the um, options which were alternative to Putin in the late 1990s, here we are uh, following the work by um, Good, uh, you'll notice that all of them were actually expressing the same idea for Russia to reassert itself as a great power and reorient its foreign policy towards former Soviet republics. Pretty much any person from the list who had any remote uh, claims uh, to become the next Russian president would have espoused some uh, in some sort of similar policies. Would it have led to the war in Ukraine? We will never know, but it would have been advantageous under pretty much every single person in this list. So this is a work in progress. We are currently considering other key studies to complement our work. So I'm very grateful for any suggestions from the audience. And uh, last but not the least, we, uh, first of all, complement the literature by introducing the uh, concept of revanche, which to our surprise was not even there from the start. Second, we demonstrate that existing explanations of revisions or revanche behavior uh, do not suffice to explain everything that's going on. Last but not the least, we argue in this paper that in order to understand what's going on in Russia's foreign policy, you need to go beyond Putin. You need to look at the elites uh, that will help explain why Russia turned out to be Russia yet again. And last but not least, um, these are some hope for Russia ultimately. If it comes down to the elites, then maybe once they were able to achieve some elite replacement on top, maybe Russia will act differently. Thank you. Thank you. As discussion, we're pleased to have Nigel Gould Davies, editor of Strategic Survey and a senior fellow for Russian Eurasia at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Nigel, I think we're looking for five, ten minutes of comments, if that would work. Fine, I'll do my best to be brief. Great to see you. Likewise, hello from good afternoon from a, a kitchen in central London. I hope you can see and hear me okay. So uh, it gives me pleasure to have the opportunity to discuss these four, I would say thematically and methodologically diverse uh, papers. Uh, and by way of 
preliminary mark just offer the thought that of course we all want to be objective and to understand as rigorously as possible uh, every aspect of uh, this war it's its causes its course and its consequences but it seems to me there's also a set of issues like no other that's of intense and urgent practical policy interest and indeed policy commitment so uh it seems to me the distinct a distinctive feature of these issues is this combination of academic rigor and policy and ethical uh, commitment no none of us is indifferent to the war or its consequences and i i say all that to to introduce the the thought that there is a a uh, at least as i see it a sort of common thread running through uh all of these papers i would say to some degree uh of a relationship or dialogue or in some cases perhaps a tension between methodological issues those that are normally uh, the domain of the academic uh, researcher and the practical policy uh, implications and consequences. So uh, it seems to me that this is a, uh, a, um, uh, a case where uh, the relationship and tensions, the bridging of the gap and, and, and so on between the academic concerns and and policy uh, consequences and ultimately policy advice is especially live. These are of personal interest to me because I, back in the day, was a uh, trained as a as a political scientist. It was a very long time ago, um, but I still remember the methodology courses. I was a con contemporary of Henry's, which tells you how long ago it was. Uh, but since then, uh, I've uh, been in the policy world and now work for a, a think tank. So. Uh, I, I'll approach the analysis of the papers through that, that prism. So firstly, Susanna Vitali. Uh, this is very interesting indeed. Uh, there's been a lot of informed analysis about the damage and apparently deliberate damage that Russia has been carrying out on a range of other Ukrainian sectors, the energy sector, for example, and we've seen most recently the, 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 the very destructive uh, set of attacks on civilian energy infrastructure, uh, the uh, efforts to violently erode uh, and efface uh, and destroy cultural and educational assets in uh, Ukraine. This is this paper is the first example I know of an attempt to to, to analyze uh, Russian behavior specifically towards the agricultural sector, and I think it does uh, the, the 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 documenting aspect of the paper is valuable. It's valuably and concisely sets out the, the significance of grain to Ukraine and ultimately to world markets. And a fascinating statistic on, on the global significance that if you add uh, uh, China and India alone together, they account for nearly 25% of, uh, of all imports of Ukrainian agro-food products. I think that's really very interesting. Uh, and documenting the many ways that Russia has degraded uh this sector i think is important i i personally would would um would be perhaps slightly uh cautious about uh inferring from this that destroying agriculture is a central war aim uh it that it does seem to me more than simply a set of collateral consequences uh and indeed over time the role of time here is interesting worth exploring it seems to me have to become increasingly uh, significant. So one question I'd have for this paper is, is how an analysis of Russian uh, depredation and destruction of the of agricultural assets and the agricultural sector more generally has changed over time? Because it might be the case, this is just a hypothesis, that early on when Russia was confident uh, initially that it could uh, seize all or most of the country very quickly and impose its own government, it would not have had an interest in destroying the agricultural sector. And uh, it may well be that uh, its efforts to do so have escalated since then uh, in a way that reflects the lack of confidence uh, that it can take 
uh, Ukraine quickly, and it's shifted uh, more to a strategy of uh, imposing longer term economic harm and damage on Ukraine. This uh, reminds us, again, partly of the role of time in every aspect of this war, but partly also uh, the fact that this is a war that in all respects is being fought on two fronts. One is by military means on uh, the battlefield, and the other is by economic means on the home fronts of the respective participants. And in respect of that second aspect, uh, the war on the home fronts, uh, attention is typically paid to uh, Russia's use of, uh, growing use of uh, a gas weapon against Europe and the West's imposition of sanctions against Russia. But we shouldn't forget, of course, that by a long, long way, the most serious economic consequences are being faced by Ukraine itself. And uh, it, it seems to me the, the evidence points in the direction, again, increasingly over time, uh, admirably documented by this paper, uh, that uh, Russia's destructive uh, 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 attacks on uh, Ukraine's agricultural sector are part of that attempt to permanently weaken uh, Ukraine and hinder its um, uh, its war effort. Uh, the I think as uh, as Suzanne uh, pointed out, the uh, use of um, the agreement on grain shipments postdates the initial writing. Uh, of this paper, it would be very interesting to to have a, a fuller analysis of uh, why that uh, uh, agreement was possible, uh, how Ukraine uh, benefits uh, from it, because it does seem to have been a shift of policy on on Russia's part. Uh, and finally, pointing to longer term policy implications for the West, it does remind us of the importance of uh, economic support uh, now, but also in the post war reconstruction to uh, follow. Uh, secondly, to Maria's paper, uh, this is very interesting uh, too, and um, the uh, the use of the logistic regression. I just about remember that from the statistics classes years ago. Uh, uh, this is a, a sophisticated attempt to to capture uh, some of the key uh, determinants of the general assembly uh, votes and explain the the fence sitting among parts of the uh, of the global south. Uh, it seems to me that the, the paper focuses primarily on uh, uh, on Russia's prior policies, as Maria uh, noted a moment ago, arms sales and COVID aid. I think one might want to push that further and ask uh, whether uh, the distribution of Russian arms sales and COVID aid uh, was to new uh, 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 partners or attempts to develop new relationships or simply reflected deeper earlier long-standing uh, affinities or partnerships with countries like uh, Vietnam and so on. Uh, and secondly, there are, there are a series of factors in the regressions that are essentially fixed in nature, uh, distance from Moscow, the World Values Survey score and so on. Now that the, the policy uh, could have perspective on this would say, well, uh, these are these are things that present and future policy can't do anything about. We can't go back into the past and try to change how Russia uh, distributed its arms or its COVID support before the war. And we certainly can't do anything about big basic geographical factors that feature in this uh, uh, regression, uh, or this series of regressions. Uh, and therefore, it seems to me from the policy point of view, the most interesting uh, the questions are those about uh, the the dynamic real time adaptive nature of the information uh, war that has evolved since uh, the invasion began, and the importance, therefore, again, the policy point of Western efforts to combat uh, RT and so on. So, a question I'd have for perhaps future uh, elaborations of these uh, models are. Can we capture, can we uh, somehow try to uh, uh, render as a variable Western efforts, uh, not just Russian efforts, but Western efforts to uh, influence the uh, information uh, space uh, in these countries? And finally, just a, a couple of more policy 
uh, relate uh, you know, a couple more points and thoughts. Three are a methodological and three are more policy oriented. The first is methodologically, uh, the the data, the, the 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 dependent variable here is the the uh, general assembly votes in March and April of this year. Uh, more recent ones are available, uh, including the recent UNGA uh, 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 vote uh, just uh, uh, early this month. And there's going to be another forthcoming one on annexation. So that provides more data uh, against which to uh, assess these, uh, these, uh, uh, these models. Uh, secondly, looking at the actual reported results, it seems to me that the, the correlation that jumps out most significantly is the very strong negative correlation between uh, liberal democracy on the one hand and the, the probability of, uh, of remaining neutral or not condemning Russia on the other. Now, I don't think this is something that the paper dwells on in its discussion of the results, but it seems to me a very significant uh, 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 implication. If it really is true that the liberal democraticness of a country is uh, one of the most, or possibly even the most significant uh, determinant of the likelihood of voting uh, against Russia, uh, that, that deserves greater attention. And it actually plays into the narrative that there, there is something of a, a kind of a global democratic norms, uh, a, a protect, a mutual protection taking place in the response to this war. Uh, uh, thirdly, uh, the arguments about uh, Erte penetration and indeed World Values survey uh, data uh, would influence uh, popular views perhaps they wouldn't necessarily influence the government so much in non-democratic uh, authoritarian countries. Uh, so uh, it, it's not clear to me what, what the mechanism for their influence might be if we're looking at the behavior, the, the voting patterns of authoritarian countries. And then a couple of policy points. So with my policy hat on, we mustn't be com complacent, of course, and we will all uh, as, a, as a policy matter, want to uh, ensure that Russia remains as isolated as possible in this war. But it seems to me that there's been a great deal of success already and that Russia, since the beginning of the war, has been uh, more isolated internationally than the Soviet Union ever was, even in the darkest days of the Cold War, including, for example, the, uh, the, uh, after the invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. In fact, for an early piece I wrote, I looked back and compared the, the UN voting records then and, and now, and Russia is much more isolated now. And I think there is a, a, a Western diplomacy success here. A related point would be how much this is actually matters in practical terms. So uh, if we're adding up global GDP, Russia remains extremely isolated. If we're uh, adding up global population, less so. So one way of trying to think about the, the significance of the extent of Russia's isolation now is whether, is whether people or money uh, matters, uh, matters more. Uh, there's also the additional point that not, not all countries are equally important. If we're counting countries in a regression, so every country counts the same, that would, that would make Eritrea as important as uh, India, for example. Uh, but we know that's not the case. And, and indeed, if we look at... Uh, at least some of the behavior uh, and, and actions, uh, so words, especially of say China and India and Turkey, even in recent weeks, even since the, the Samarkand summit, then I think there's evidence that Russia is becoming even more uh, isolated. Uh, and finally, finally, uh, a, a policy way into this would be to ask not what sort of fixed factors about countries explain their voting records, but what interests drive their behavior. Our interests, of course, can change in response to changing circumstances. And as the war has deteriorated for Russia, and as the global negative externalities of it have increased, I do think we have seen, in some cases, some shifts uh, away from uh, Russia. Now, uh, it seems to me a, a, a regression model like this would find it difficult. Daniel, we have about two or three minutes left, so if we can. Yeah, OK, OK. Would find it difficult to adapt uh, to changes in, in voting records over time. So I encourage some reflection on that. Uh, Adam and Dennis's uh, uh, paper. So uh, this is interesting. Uh, I was less familiar with the methodology 
uh, used. And I, I might offer some re respectful difference of view on some of the, the, the conclusions that follow uh, from it. It's possible I simply may have not understood it, but uh, on the basis of the uh, of the uh, of the apparent source base, it, it seems to me that there are there are there is a sort of a question to be raised. If the if the set of event codes is uh, derived from the Russian and non-Russian press, then it seems to me that we are using as the source base what Western journalists are writing and what the Russian state is messaging through its uh, its media, its state-controlled media outlets. So the question would be, is that the best basis for trying to understand the dynamics of Russian policy? Uh, and uh, it, I mean, there may be reasons why Russian state media were deliberately uh, misleading, uh, for example. Uh, I, I would tend, to, I'll, 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 more to say, but I'm running out of time. So I just say, in, in my view, broadly speaking, there is a, a, a consistency to the logic of events, logic of events that drove uh, Russian policy towards uh, war. Uh, and essentially that consists of the, of the falling away of any means short of war that uh, Russia sought to uh, make use of in the year or so before uh, the breakout of war. I personally do not see the, the confusion and ambiguity uh, that, uh, including across domains, uh, that the authors do, but maybe that would have to await uh, another time to discuss more fully. Finally, Maria's paper, uh, very interesting, I hadn't, didn't have a, a paper to read beforehand, but very briefly, fully agree, revisionism is, uh, in its loose and willy definitions, un unhelpful, and revanchism is a much more uh, tightly drawn and analytically useful uh, category. My question about this would be whether there is a theory as such uh, to explore here, or where, whether we're really just talking about Russia. Uh, it's not clear to me that the N is very large. If we're looking for examples of former imperial states that have sought to uh, regain territory and also where there is elite continuity. It seems to be only Germany after 1918 uh, immediately comes to mind as a, another example. There are lots of empires where elite continuity has been high that have not sought to regain uh, territory. And those are the maritime empires, of course. So there's a, a distinction there between land and, and maritime uh, empires. And, and just finally, on the on the question of a, elite continuity and uh, the implications of, of, of the war and, and how it might develop uh, hereafter. Uh, yes, there was widely shared uh, uh, incomprehension and even resentment at the, the, the breakup of the Soviet Union. And even someone like Yegor Gaidar, recall, we talked about the phantom limb uh, of empire. Uh, it seems to me that's not quite the same as saying that the elite as a whole is in favor of this war or as war as a way of resolving the question. My own personal view is that the central gravity of elite opinion is uh, would much rather this war end quickly, and that the implication of that is that if Putin were to to leave the scene, the war would more likely than not uh, end sooner rather than later. That's a, a large provocation for this audience. I know. Happy to discuss it in a slower time, another time and place. But all very interesting, thought provoking papers, and I look forward to the discussion that follows. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nigel. It's okay if everyone wants to come to the audience and take a couple questions and then give the panelists a chance to respond. So, Thank you. I'm Marcia McGraw Olive at uh, Wilson Center and SIPES. And I have a question for all the uh, speakers. Um, Thank you. Uh, first, I wanted to just add, I'll ask the question, then I have just two data points I wanted to add. Um, the question is. <laughs> With all of Russia's soft power and economic coercive tools, why would it resort to a military solution if you're looking across domains, particularly if it relates to a, an elite foreign policy attitude dating to the 90s? And if revanchism survives the war, how will it be operationalized in foreign policy? 
And that's for all the speakers, mainly here in the room. I think the agriculture one may be less uh, central to the question. If I wanted to add just two quick data points, Igor Gaidar often spoke about the pact with Belarus to us and the World Bank back in the 90s, uh, but then said, we can't afford it now. We will come back to Belarus when we can afford to take it back under our wing. And on the latest soft power data, there was a vote two days ago for the head of the ITU in the UN. There was an American and a Russian candidate, 175 countries voting, 139 for the American and 25 for the Russian. Thank you. Any other questions? Maris Kassianova from, from all my <laughs> region. Um, well, a couple of points. Um, to Maria, um, I was wondering if it makes sense to uh, kind of categorize uh, the votes because it's somewhat practical. If you get the weapons, of course, you know, kind of. Yeah, you want to continue uh, getting them, and uh, there are also kind of more normative. Right. And if you look at how, for example, Central Asians vote, right, or China votes, right? like if it's an issue of separatism, right, recognition, non recognition, here you have your own agenda, you know, kind of normative agenda, and definitely you vote your state, basically, right. Uh, but if it's something like on the you know, Human Rights Council, I right? think like, there is not your something of you know, importance for you. That's why we can work together with Russia at least. Uh, so maybe you can kind of categorize the roles and uh, align with the interests. And um, on the continuity of elites, I, I, I agree with, uh, with Nigel, you can have continuity of elites, but, but then I think it's more a question of uh, world views. Uh, uh, and um, if you look at different, uh, different well, countries that are post-imperial, uh, it seems to me there are two alternatives. One is more imperial and one is more nationalist. So Turkey, for example, then yeah, in this direction, right? Like why would you want to share shifting empire, right? Uh, that's because you want to build up your kind of nation, uh, nation state. Um, so and it's interesting why in the case of Russia it was so difficult. Thanks. And uh Seb. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Sam Green from Case College London and and, and CIPO. Um, thought provoking, uh, really for, for everybody. So thanks for the thanks for that. I'll read the papers with with interest. Um, this isn't anybody in particular, but going to, to, to I think pretty much all of the all of the papers. Um, in thinking about sort of intentionality, uh, there's two things I struggle to figure out how to work into into all of these arguments and, and, and models. One is mistakes. Right. Um, so. Uh, you know, we've heard all, a lot about uh, the possibility that Putin, you know, was getting bad intelligence, right, uh, and, and had bad analysis about what he was facing in Ukraine, and how the West would respond, and maybe even how his own military would perform, right? But I don't, we don't seem to be very good at, at, at figuring that into a model of, of, of decision making. Um, so we kind of assume that, well, that he must have known, right, that there were going to be all of these all of these problems, and, and and so what was it that made him willing to take on those? Those risks, right? So, how can we adapt models for, for that? The other thing is shifting logic. I think a lot of these arguments tend to be built on the assumption that, um, you know, there was a region or a reason for going into the war, uh, and that that same reason then dictates all the decisions that are made after the war begins. Um, and is it possible that, um, you know, the, the, the reasons that got people on board on the 23rd, 24th of February, right, might be actually very different from the reasons that are leading to events on the, the 30th of, of September? Great, thank you. So why don't we turn the floor back over to the presenters, perhaps in reverse order, then we can start us off. Um, feel free to comment, comment on anything from the discussant or from the questions from the audience. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Excellent uh, comments. Uh, thank you very much, Nigel, and apologies for not having sent you the paper before. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, we actually do agree with the point about Maritime part being different from land part, and our argument 
quick land is not applicable to land applies. Uh, but to be able to counter the criticism about the fact that continuity of the land does not necessarily mean the ranches, we will need to build up the data set. Uh, we haven't yet uh, done it, so apologies. I can argue that it's really not just the case of Russia. You have multiple cases of countries like Yugoslavia, uh, for example, with Milosevic. We can think of way more uh, Germany as well where uh, the illegal continuity did uh, translate into revanche. So it might be a sufficient condition, might be not necessary. The conditions that we are actually still figuring out, it's a paper in progress. Uh, thank you very much. On the uh, question of why we all good or resources Russia had, uh, uh, but it's still resorted to military uh, solutions, I think it's a little bit different from my view, but I'll, I'll try to quickly answer. Um, if you read the uh, Putin's uh, 2021, about historical community of Russia and Ukraine, uh, which is really uh, presents a really different vision of world history. Uh, you can see he explains his views very uh, well, right? Essentially, he uh, accepts that Russia's been with soft power corruption completely and it lost Ukraine. And the only thing that's left is to now try to coerce uh, with the hard power and, 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 until, unless it becomes, before it becomes too late. Uh, he literally uh, says it, and when you read uh, this, we read this article once again from September 2022. Uh, he will hear him Thank you, Nigel, so much for your wonderful comments. Um, a lot to chew on. And um, just for the full disclaimer, um, so it's you know, uh, most of these presentations of you know, it's based on research which is either in progress or it's just preliminary and it's sort of like really to chew on something. Um, so with, with that said, I think uh, maybe you really nail down um, what I am trying to get at in the paper. Namely, um, I want to highlight the shift in logics, and I want to highlight that there is this tension between normative reason and pragmatic motivation. And I think um, in the discourse, and even the way the United States or the West tried to present this unity, as if it was grounded in this shared normative condemnation, um, you know that you know that that, that 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 everyone who condemns Russia, they are united in um, the kind of views um, that the liberal international order framework is, is is premised upon, and but you know Russia doesn't think this way. Uh, Russia understands that there are alternative logics, alternative uh, motivations, and it has been able to exploit uh, those loopholes, those alternative uh, and pragmatic motivations to get countries do what benefits benefits Russia. And therefore, A, I don't think that it has been too much of a shift. Like even looking at this data point that, you know, out of 175 member states, 139 voted for an American ITU, Representative, and only 25 voted for the Russian one. I mean, depending on how you frame it, is it glass, glass half full? Yeah, 139 voted for the American one. Or is it glass half you know, empty? And we actually have 25 countries still voting for the Russian one. Or if you go back to uh, the most recent United Nations General Assembly meeting that happened just a week ago, the, uh, the, the Senegalese representative currently uh, ahead of the African Union. Essentially, it repeats the kind of language that they've been using to, you know, refuse taking side and still not condemning Russia. I mean, so, and again, it, and, and even if we do see the change, what is this change? You, war hurts, war hurts everyone, especially Ukraine and Ukrainians, but it hurts a lot of people around the world, right? And so this shift could be simply like, we are tired. You know, we don't care about the norms. We don't care about the principles that we are hurting. And I think as long as we are kind of um, oblivious, briefly oblivious to, you know, why countries do and say, like all these tricks in logic, right, that, that, that I've already mentioned. I think um, in the longer run, in the medium, uh, a longer run, I think there will be kind of maybe a global shift or we are going to, again, you know, create this liberal international order that is only limited to, you know, the United States and Europe, you know, and, and a handful of countries in other parts of the world versus the rest. I think that's also one of kind of my concerns that we are not quite understanding where, you know, all other countries are coming from. Okay, I'll just stop there. 
Well, I just want to thank Nigel and Marjorie and Sam for underscoring really the point and the motivation for the paper, which is to try to do a little bit of empirical mind sweeping uh, and not let our assumptions about the intentions, about the inevitability, uh, run the run the uh, our analysis. And so, uh, with the same caveat that uh, Maria just mentioned, that this is very preliminary. But what we're trying to do is map and mesh different types of data to see if we can get a signal. But I mean, at the heart of the matter is, as Sam mentioned, and what we're trying to look at was this an issue of misinformation. And this perception is this an, an issue of intentions and so it was just a matter of time or our strategies fundamentally misaligned and with due respect i do think looking back in, in 2021 there was a lot more ambiguity and uncertainty on our side about what russia was doing and we were looking for signals and so looking back now maybe we can uh since we do actually have an endpoint of when coercion shifted to into the hard power use of force on a large scale, that we can look for some of these signals. And maybe it will be that this was clearly unavoidable, uh, but we've already seen Mr. Putin make some informational, uh, make some mistakes suggesting of some informational issues. But I think when we start to dig deeper, we see that we may know less about their strategies of influence and coercion uh, than we think we do. And again, this is relatively moot right now because we're dealing with a hard and fast problem on the ground, but it is going to be our fundamental problem moving forward in whatever context uh, we, we have to uh, address. Thank you. Suzanne, would you like the opportunity to respond? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'll keep it brief, but I also want to uh, thank Nigel. The The comments were incredibly uh, thoughtful and pretty much, you know, what we're wrestling with um, as we as we do this research. So, you know, obviously these things are unfolding right now and there is sort of we did, you know, wrestle with the, 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 the conundrum of, you know, do we do we do we publish now or do we kind of, uh, you know, keep thinking and, and gathering big, big, uh, better evidence and, and I, I absolutely agree that, you know, there uh, it's uh, on the sort of question, what does this all mean? What, what is Russia actually trying to do? We don't really have enough uh, evidence in this um, uh, policy memo. You know, that said, there's also a lot of things that uh, we know uh, both, um, there's sort of two big elephants uh, in the room that didn't make it into the policy memo just because of the format and the two big elephants are our are, are history, right? There, there's a history to this uh, Russia-Ukrainian relations in terms of farming. Uh, and grain and the other big elephant is of course this that Russia is also a very big uh, grain exporter Russia is the largest exporter of wheat and even though we know how Russia we know much more about how Russia is using the energy weapon Russia is actually also using the food weapon and it's becoming very uh, very clear and a lot of this is sort of about the interaction between Russia Ukraine and then uh, poor populous uh, countries right so it it doesn't really concern the West uh, as much right just you know in the US we uh, don't import Ukrainian Eurasian grain but so, so this is uh, is is very much about Ukraine Russia uh, and China and Nigeria, Egypt, Turkey, that are all importers of Eurasian grain. So, so um, I really uh, like your point about timing that we should sort of figure out when uh, these different things happen. I, I uh, want to pursue that uh, in the future. Uh, just, I guess one more one more thing on the on the history is. Um, you know, Russia, as we, as we all know, Russia has tried to get Ukraine to pursue certain policies, uh, you know, since uh, for over the last 20, 20 uh, uh, 30 years. And, and one of the things that Russia tried to do um, is to form a, a grain OPEC with Ukraine and, and Kazakhstan. And, and uh, Ukraine didn't go along with this uh, but before uh, 2014, and then it sort of fell apart uh, in 2014. So this, we, we we see this very much as a sort of continued uh, um, uh, uh, manifestations of the Ukra uh, relationship between Russia uh, and Ukraine in this in this uh, uh, in this you know uh, sector of, of grain that isn't quite as well known. And and in in terms of the audience question about economic coercion, yeah, Russia does not have any. Uh, ability to coerce uh, Ukraine, but Russia definitely has an ability to coerce other countries uh, with its its grain uh, potential and, and grain prowess. Thanks. 
Thank you. So as you prepare another round of questions, let's take one from the virtual audience. From Anna Melnikovska, it's for Suzanne. Um, how have the Ukrainian big agro holdings reacted and adapted to the war situation? Has the war increased or decreased the influence of the agro holdings slash agro oligarchs in Ukraine's politics? Other questions? Yes, in the back. You can go to the microphone and shoot yourself. Uh, I'm Ted Blackburn from the uh, Institute for Defense Analysis. My question is for Adam. Um, so when you look at the, you look at the, um, uh, uh, the the questions that you're asking, it seems like you're focusing more on the messaging side of um, uh, of signaling. I'm curious whether that was done purposely, um, and whether you are thinking about looking at more signals that were sent through actual military activities um, or economic activities before, and I'll give one, which is uh, like the closure of the embassy uh, uh, in February, right before the war, which I think probably sent a signal to uh, Putin. Great, and actually, right next to you, there, and then in the back. Okay, while well, Mike is here, Shailen uh, Juraya from Bishkek, a quick question to Maria on revanchism. I think I really like this so I set up with the revanchism and elite continuity, but then where is Ukraine here? Is it variable? The political regime in Ukraine in the target country, or does it not matter at all? That is, if Yanukovych was still in power, would we still have the developments as we see or not? Another another question from the second round. And Uh, my name is Samar Chatterjee, the Safe Foundation. Uh, since the topic is Russian strategies and consequences, uh, seems like all the papers that have been presented, they are more anti-Russian strategies and consequences. Um, my position is that if all of these research are funded and supported either by U.S. organizations or U.S. government, uh, you folks would get pretty rich uh, because Russia not only has, um, it has been there less than a year, it has another 19 years to go before it'll either be forced out or it'll voluntarily leave uh, Ukraine or occupy Ukraine fully. So given that uh, um, uh, you, you should be addressing what Russian strategies really is, because from these papers, we don't understand what the Russian strategies and consequences are. Thanks, then we have a final question. Go back around, yep. Uh, hi, um, one question for my- You could introduce yourself before you. I'm sorry? If you could introduce yourself. Good, oh, sorry, my name is Jose Seva from Guatemala. Uh, one question for Maria and another for Maria. I uh, wonder if you could uh, are able to speculate a little bit on the capacity of the Ukrainian defense to um, detect and prevent uh, a dirty bomb or whatever you might call it uh, before it launches. Um, and to Maria, in terms of the revanchism, do you see a correlation between that um, thought and the uh, and the conservative let's say politics of, of uh, Putin and his allies in Europe um, in terms of um, in other words if there would be a change of power and a liberal comes along would revanchism still be a factor great well there's a lot to chew on there Suzanne maybe we could start with you um, and go the normal order of the pattern uh, of the panel we've got about two two and a half minutes per person before we'll cut out for the lunch break. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. That is, uh, you know, what's the role of the agro holdings? We're we're absolutely interested in that, and we're we're working it. Uh, we're working on it. So, uh, you know, the short answer is that agro holdings are uh, uh, the most affected by this, right? Because this is about uh, monoculture, large commodity crops, and and the agro holdings uh, dominate that sector, and they are least able to 
you know, just kind of shift and adapt to these uh, very difficult circumstances. So the agro holdings are uh, sustaining enormous um, uh, economic losses. There's, you know, high, extremely high degree of loss um, that they're grappling with right now. So um, e agro holdings uh, are both dominated by Ukrainian domestic uh, oligarchs, but uh, and some uh, Western investors and global agricultural companies like Monsanto. Uh, but there's also a lot of Russian uh, oligarchs that were uh, and have have been involved in in Russian agriculture. So you know, it, we we're, we can only speculate. We don't know, but it seems very plausible that. Um, uh, this was uh, these Russian uh, agro holdings that are invested in Ukraine were actually involved in negotiating the grain corridor um, because it, it it is just a way to get some uh, grain out and and the work we're actually doing uh, in now and in the future is sort of about uh, agriculture under siege right well how how will this all work out in the future and I think agro holdings uh, are going to be a big actor uh, in 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 that question thank you. Thank you. So I just want to I just want to thank that the observation and yes the the question is about whether or not we're looking at uh, some of the hard data like military exercises, diplomatic uh, closures of embassies or sanctions. And so yes, what we're doing, what I just showed you here, is a very preliminary look where we're looking at events data and looking at specific statements. We're actually in the process of trying to understand what those statements are. Because at times he's very explicit about red lines, other times there's much more ambiguity. So we're trying to look for and refine our understanding of what those signals are. And then when we get that, we're going to go back and plot or, or annotate with more hard types of uh, known activities, like, like the things that you mentioned, including the embassy uh, shutdown or economic sanctions or energy price changes and or uh, military exercises to get more fidelity on whether or not there are signals associated with what we're finding using these larger uh, pieces of data. So, and to answer the other question, that's what we're trying to get at, is trying to understand oh, what that strategy is. And more importantly, and not just the ends and the means, but specifically the ways and how they're thinking about things. Uh, so we're not there yet, but that is the goal. Okay, wow. Okay, so very briefly, I, I don't have knowledge about the whether or not you know Ukrainian defense uh, um, has you know capabilities to detect and prevent dirty bombs. I mean, so the assumption is that yes, there are probably will be some uh, concerns with landmines left in you know previously of Russia occupied you know territories. But I think you know just just like any um, armed force or any um, you know that there should be some capabilities to 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 identify those locations. But I would definitely look into. Um, what evidence that is being gathered in terms of you know, war crimes and crimes against humanity committed by uh, Russian troops and um, even those landmines would definitely fall under you know, one of those um, um, violations. But let me also take on this question about you know, us not looking into Russia's strategy. I think we, Western analysts in particular, uh, have a tendency to approach every other country's um, operations, including Russian operations, to the lens of strategy. Um, whereas there could be none. Um, Putin has not been known as a strategist. Um, and you know, there are some questions about him uh, being a good tactician. Um, but because the war was uh, an operation, um, there might have been some flawed assumptions made, but whether or not those assumptions were some kind of connected into a viable um, theory of victory and strategy, it's, it's a huge question. So I I, I think you know we, we you know we are kind of biasing ourselves to look into strategy when we expect that there is a strategy when there might be none to begin with. And um and, and, and one more point here is that um Russia has also been known to use a lot of kind of trial and error approach, kind of you know doing something or or, or adopting a, a, a bunch of discrete uh, approaches thinking that you know something is gonna pan out um and those discrete approaches would not be connected into any kind of strategy either. So thank you so much for Great question. So first of all, I um, have been reminded by the question that they have not uh, put enough emphasis on what it is that we're looking at, uh, whether that's Ukraine's uh, regime. Absolutely true. But our concept of revanchism primarily focuses on the world, the preferences of the elites. So we don't necessarily look at the actions of uh, uh, given uh, states, because, of course, states' behavior is influenced by multiple um, Actually, among them, the capabilities of the states, right? So we clearly see that Russia becomes more aggressive 
in with relationship to the oil revenues that it receives, and essentially the capabilities that it possesses. So that is outside of the scope of the paper because it's impossible to cover everything. And of course, uh, going back to the question of Ukraine's regime, under Yanukovych, Putin would have probably thought that he has Ukraine under control. So it's hard to say um, what the actions would have been then, but we can really possible as you probably there would not be war. But then again, it's also impossible to assume that Ukraine would have uh, kept Yanukovych in power for as long as Putin wanted. Uh, so that's the first uh, issue. Uh, the second question uh, is, thank you for it, uh, based on how I understood it, would Putin still be spreading, uh, so how does uh, this right-wing conservative method spread in Europe? It seems to argue. Um, so we, we actually see the continuity of the goals. The goals are there, right, for Russia to raise to itself its great power, what is different is uh, other tools. So Russia, since the Soviet times, uh, has abandoned its strong, ideolo ideolo strong ideological commitments and it's much more opportunistic, uh, right? So now Russia presents itself when it needs as this last defender of the Christian civilization, which I find very ironic for the state that was largely atheist during the old 20th century, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, but at the same time, the goals are the same, right? They assert control specifically under its so-called spirit mm -hmm. of interest, but also wherever possible. Um, and the last question, will the liberal leader change his parties? I would say it depends, right, on the background, background of the leader. But in general, even when working on this data set for Security Council, we tend to notice that uh, those individuals who have less, fewer connections to the manufacturer, they actually tend to be uh, tend to feel more human, <laughs> so to speak, in their current policies and in general. Uh, so I think the party would be there still. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to everyone for a fantastic panel. Let's give everyone a round of applause. Yeah, our yeah. panel is tough, yeah, right? I think something yeah. that you're missing yeah. in the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Uh,